So looking at abdominal and genitourinary injuries, there are some competencies that you will have to achieve by the end of this chapter. And these are what you will need to know by the time we finish this chapter. So as it relates to trauma in general, you must be able to apply the fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency care and transportation based on assessment findings for an acutely injured patient. As it relates to abdominal and genitourinary trauma, these are the competencies we'll be looking at to achieving by the end of the chapter. You must be able to recognize and manage blunt versus penetrating mechanisms. You must be able to recognize and manage evisceration and is an evisceration or an impaled object as it relates to the abdomen or genital urinary injuries. Also, you must be able to look at the pathophysiology and assessment and management of solid and hollow organs injuries, blunt versus penetrating mechanisms, evisceration, you must know the pathophysiology and be able to assess and manage injuries to the external genitalia and vaginal bleeding due to trauma, also sexual assault. These are the competencies that you must be able to achieve as we go through this chapter. So introduction, introduction, I told you in the last session I did with you that the human body, all the anatomy, physiology that you went through, you'll be seeing it as you go forward in the course. And I'm sure you would have gone through most of them again as you went through medical emergencies and so far that you have reached in trauma emergencies. So again, these are fundamental knowledge that you must know, and I would encourage everyone to ensure that you know them and don't lose them. Ensure you build on them as you go forward because you'll be coming back to them again and again. So the abdomen extends from the diaphragm to pelvis, which you would have gone through already. We're just gonna do a quick recap of those um, anatomy and physiology and it contains organs that make up digestive urinary and genitourinary systems and i would imagine we all know by now once we say genitourinary it's a combination of the system of reproduction as well as the urinary system combined because they work together they share most of the organs. And we know that the abdomen contains a lot of organs as it relates to the digestive system. We'll be looking at those. So if there is significant trauma to the abdomen, it can occur from blunt trauma, penetrating trauma, or both. And once you recognize the organs that are there in that space and how they function, then you can have an idea of what injuries can occur. And the big thing that you will recognize is how you're going to treat with those and the signs and symptoms that will be told and seen when they have those sort of injuries. So injuries to the abdomen that go unrecognized are are not repaired in surgery are a leading cause of traumatic death. And this is something that you need to pay attention to because a lot of times you will go unseen and these injuries are not recognized. They are, you have a tunnel vision and you overlook certain subtle um, underlying injuries and that, that's not going to go well for your patient. 
So just quickly re recapping anatomy and physiology of the abdomen. Again, I said you would have gone through this before. We know that the abdomen is divided into four general quadrants. Just imaginary line that dissects at the umbilicus and you get those four quadrants. Quadrant of bruising and pain can delineate which organs are involved. What we are saying here, when you assess your patient and you observe bruising or pain to a section or one of the quadrant, then your knowledge of the structure that is within that space will give you an idea of what possible organ is injured. And then you can know how do the system works and then you can have an idea exactly what the presentation the patient will give you and you will know what you need to do. So for the right upper quadrant, we should know by now that the liver, the gallbladder, the duodenum, and the pancreas is within that space. And the duodenum is the first section of your small intestine. So you must know what structures are within each space, and then you will have an idea of what presentation and, and what injury the person, patient will have from that sign that they are seeing. And they, we talk about topographical anatomy so on the surface you will see signs and then you will know and have an idea it doesn't have to be but your index of suspicion should let you recognize that there's possible underlying injury and this is what you're talking about if you don't have that suspicion then you're gonna miss it and just think it's just a superficial injury to the surface while underlying organs are damaged so we're always gonna think the worst in the pre-hospital settings until we know otherwise. And sometimes you won't know otherwise until you take in the patient. Left upper quadrant will have the stomach and the spleen. These are the crucial structures that are there within these spaces. For the left lower quadrant, and again, remember when we talk about left and right, we are referring to the patient's left and right, not you as a caregiver assessing that patient. So for the left lower quadrant, we have the descending colon and the left transverse colon. And we know the colon is a large intestine. For the right lower quadrant, and this is a very important area that we should recognize, we talk about the appendix. So for the right lower quadrant, you have the large and small intestine within that space, but very importantly, they have the appendix. This is a structure that can be come inflamed, it can rupture, and the content is spilled in the peritoneal space, the abdominal cavity, and cause serious infection. It can lead the patient into septic shock, and that's a life-threatening situation. So once the patient has any pain to that right lower quadrant, one of your biggest suspicions is it can be appendix which is inflamed or can lead to appendicitis. As we continue with anatomy and physiology of the abdomen, we see the division that they have there. So you should ensure that you know this diagram, know the different quadrants, and says the right lower quadrant is a common location for swelling and inflammation, as I said before. So very important, once you have a patient with abdominal pain, and you do your, <coughs> sorry, once you do your assessment and you palpate and you recognize that it's right lower quadrant, your big index of suspicion, possible appendix is the issue. So within the abdominal space, you have hollow organs and you have solid organs. So hollow organs, as the name suggests, those will be mainly your tubular structures. So your the stomach, intestines, large and small intestines, the ureters, and by now we know you have ureters and urethra, and also you have your bladder. So when ruptured or lacerated, content spill into the peritoneal cavity, and the contents from the hollow organs are normally very um, acidic and they can cause intense 
inflammatory reaction and infection such as peritonitis. And peritonitis is inflammation of the peritoneum. And the peritoneum is the lining of the peritoneal cavity. So it's a very serious implications when you have hollow organs ruptured. And again, know your quadrant and recognize where they have pain or bruising and have that index of suspicion that those organs within those spaces can be affected. You also have hollow organs of the intestine from the mesentery, so intestinal blood supplies from the mesentery. These can be spilled also and they connect the small intestine to the abdominal wall. So patients with injury to the mesentery can bleed into the peritoneal cavity. Again, these are not as irritating as the hollow organs, which are acidic, but these blood can also cause irritation. This is a diagram that you all need to know. So in situated as it relates to the quadrants and we Are you hearing me clearly? Thank you. So we see where the right upper quadrant, we have the gallbladder. And these are on the hollow organs we are looking at on the left, my left. <laughs> For the right lower quadrant, we mentioned the appendix, and we have the left upper quadrant, we see the stomach, and the left lower quadrant, we see you have the small intestine and also the um, descending colon. So again, ensure you have an idea of where the structures are positioned so you can recognize that index of suspicion for which organs are possibly injured or damaged when you have trauma to the abdomen. On the my right diagram, you will see the solid organs. I need to recognize the liver is on the right upper quadrant. You have the kidneys. Also, you have the spleen on the left upper quadrant, and you have the left um, kidney would be on the left upper quadrant um, going down to the lower quadrant and that's on the also the retroperitoneal space. So study that diagram and make sure you know it. So recognize the solid organs are the liver, spleen, pancreas, kidneys, they perform chemical work of the body and these produce enzyme, they cleanse the blood and they aid in energy production. These organs have a rich supply of blood and once they are damaged, you have significant bleeding can occur. So they very likely would have severe bleeding once these solid organs are damaged. As you look at the mechanism of injury, you have um, injuries to the abdomen are considered either opened or closed, and it can involve either the hollow or solid organs. So for open, Abdominal injuries, you'd expect the abdominal wall to be penetrated and you can have organs being exposed. The high likelihood for infection from the outside. And for the closed abdominal injuries, the wall of the abdominal cavity is not perforated or penetrated, but 
normally from blunt force you will have underlying organs can be damaged so you will have pain bruising there is no open wound but suspect that underlying organ can be damaged and you'll always look at your mechanism of injury will be your guide as to what is likely to happen so don't overlook the fact that once there's a pain and bruising tell yourself that this is not just superficial always think the worst that organs can be damaged either solid organs or hollow organs within the spaces can be damaged just by your mechanism of injury so you will always look at your mechanism of injury once you are dealing with trauma you must look at the mechanism of injury because that is what you're gonna use as your guide to give you that index of suspicion of what the extent of the damage is remember they say energy cannot be lost so it is just converted so if a force is applied to the body it's gonna transfer into heat and um damage so it's gonna cause damage while once it's dissipating so for blunt trauma to the abdomen these are the mechanisms of injury that can cause blunt trauma to the abdomen and when we talk about blunt trauma we are talking about an era of a wide era of contact to the body so in this case is the abdomen so a broad era of contact by a wide object and so this is what's gonna cause these blunt trauma motor vehicle crashes motorcycle crashes falls blast injuries pedestrian versus bicycle rapid deceleration and compression and when we talk about compression we are talking about um seat belt can be used to compress um organs if it's not mainly not worn properly even when it's worn properly can still cause compression rapid deceleration so a person vehicle is coming at 30 miles per hour and it crashes into a pole just coming from 30 and you reach to zero that's rapid deceleration so again the force is transmitted through the body in that rapid deceleration and just imagine significant damage can occur and the greater the speed or velocity then the greater the damage signs and symptoms so this is where you're gonna be your bread and butter as ems providers so all the background knowledge you're gonna have anatomy and physiology this is important information but when you go in the field you're gonna be getting seen signs and you're gonna be told symptoms so these this is what you're gonna use to recognize what's happening to your patient once you have looked at your mechanism of injury and even without you seeing or they telling you, you should have an idea of what you should be seeing and they should be telling you. And this is what you're going to look at. And from this knowledge and information, you're going to come up with your treatment as to what you need to do for your patient. So for signs and symptoms, as it relates to closed abdominal injuries, you will have blood in the peritoneal cavity and it will produce acute pain in entire abdomen. So we talk about the contents being spilled from the solid organs, especially we said they are very vascular. They have a lot of blood supply. So once they are injured, then blood is going to be spilled in the peritoneal cavity. And the peritoneal cavity is the same abdominal cavity, the space in which these organs are housed. Again, you will have abdominal distension and this often the result of free fluid blood or organ content spilling into the peritoneal cavity so this cavity can hold a lot of fluid so it's gonna take a long time for it to be distended once you have a person with a distended abdomen from a trauma then that person is in a bad state so but that's you need to assess for that abdominal bruising and discoloration so usually we will observe this first they will have pain then you will observe bruising and discoloration again don't take it lightly that it's just a bruise or a discoloration on the surface your index of suspicion should come in right away and tell you that this bruise and discoloration is indicative of something serious underlying that 
area, the structures and organs beneath that area can be significantly impacted and you need to recognize that. Also, we will see further on, on you can have referred pain and you might have bruising and discoloration in one ear and the person is having pain in another ear. So again, don't have what we call a tunnel vision. Do your proper assessment at all times and you will not you cannot go wrong. We will see as we go into patient assessment. So for closed abdominal injuries, we are looking at mechanism of injury, seat belts. They can cause blunt injuries of abdominal organs. So when we don't wear our seat belts properly, that's when we set up ourselves for getting these injuries. So particularly when belt lies too high, can cause bladder injuries to pregnant patients. Remember to inspect beneath the ear bag for signs of damage to the steering column. So remember, pregnant um, patient, they, because of the uterus being moved out of the pelvic cavity, they can have these injuries easier than non-pregnant patients. So ensure you do your proper assessment. Once you have a trauma case, you have to ensure you look at the mechanism of injury. A vehicle is MVA, look at the inside of the vehicle, check the steering, any bent um, steering. Ensure you look at those things because that will give you an index of suspicion of what damage the patient have based on where you expect they would have been impacted. And again, don't just think on the surface, think deeper. So these are the position we say, the correct position, it should be right across the hip bone and not too high, not too low. So again, it must be weird, worn properly. So it's not just to say a person have on their seat belt, but it's to ensure that it is worn properly. First time we could have seat the lap and the shoulder harness are separated, but now they are all in one. So even though that's the case, person still can end up putting the shoulder harness behind them that let the seat be, be wearing it instead of they are the ones wearing it. So again, ensure sometimes you have to educate the people as an EMS provider because it's better to prevent than to cure. Even though we are in the business of doing the work, we don't want the unnecessary work. If we can prevent, it's better. So we have to practice prevention, educate our patients. Open abdominal injuries. This is where we say the abdominal wall is penetrated, can have contents being exposed in the same case of a evisceration, abdominal evisceration. So it can be intestine, it can be any of the organs. So for foreign objects enters abdomen and opens peritoneal cavity to the outside. So again, it sets up the patient for infection from outside and also internal organs can still be damaged. So with an open abdominal injury, it's double um, problems, exposure to the outside, but also internal organ can still be damaged. So don't, because you see the outside, um, the wall being ruptured, you just think about what you're seeing outside. Think also that the damage can continue inward. In case of a stabbing incident, you'll have the entrance wound, but also you don't know how far that weapon has gone inside of the abdominal cavity. Gunshot wound is the same thing. So open wounds can be deceiving, maintain a high index of suspicion. So again, think broad, think deep, don't think narrow, don't be narrow mind, tunnel vision in your thinking. Always think the worst until we know otherwise. And again, most time we won't know on the scene in the field. We'll have to take in the patient and those patients more than likely will need surgical intervention. So con continued abdominal injuries. Damage depends on velocity of object. So this is very important for us to recognize that Speed, just as in a motor vehicle accident, the faster the vehicle is going, the more likely is the damage, greater the injury. 
So we have three types of velocity to consider. You have low velocity injuries, which cause from knives or other edged weapons. So these are weapons that you just use your hand to inflict injury. But you also have a greater velocity, which is medium velocity injuries. These are caused from smaller caliber handguns and shotguns. So these are greater velocity than the low velocity by a person who's wielding a knife or at a sharp object. Medium velocity is going to be more injury, more energy generated. But you have the worst case one, high velocity injuries. These are high powered rifles and handguns. And I guess persons in here can recognize or identify with that. So imagine a high powered rifle, gunshot compared to a smaller caliber, you expect that you're going to have more significant injury. And we talk about cavitation. The greater the force, the more cavitation. And cavitation is the opening of a pathway as the object passes through the abdominal cavity. And that can be significant. The greater the force, the more cavitation, more damage done. So when you compare high and medium velocity injuries, you have this temporary wound channel, as, as I said, it caused by cavitation. So it forms as pressure wave from the projectile transfers to tissues, and it can produce large amount of bleeding. So it's going to open up that um, space as it passes through and significant damage. If you pass in through solid organs, then you expect that those are vasc very vascular. So you can have significant bleeding. Again, you won't know the exact pathway, but you must have that index of suspicion. Once there is open wound, entrance wound, I suspect that there is an exit wound and you should assess and look for you should look for it and treat it so the person have an entrance wound to the anterior section of the abdomen you must have that suspicion that there's an exit wound and you will have to check the front control at bleeding and also lag roll the patient and see if there's an exit wound that you must control it also for low velocity injuries and we say it's like a person getting stabbed with a knife or other sharp object also have a capacity to damage organs internal injury may not be apparent if injury is at or below ziffard process assume it has affected the thoracic and peritoneal cavities so once it within that middle region where the diaphragm is we say that the abdomen extend from your diaphragm to your pelvic therefore if it's within that region right below the zified process then they are saying it's right at the junction and so it might not only be abdominal injuries but you can have thoracic involved so the lungs can be affected when you have injury right at the borderline and again even though it's a low velocity injury don't tell yourself that it's not deep you don't tell yourself it's just on the surface you see a stab wound in the abdomen tell yourself that abdominal organs can be affected either hollow or solid so for an evisceration we say it's a bowel protruding from the peritoneum and in this case it says um abdominal ev evisceration but it, and it's evisceration in general it can be any of the organs are intestine protruding usually it's the intestine but it can be any of the organs protruding can be painful and visually shocking so just the sight of it it will let you turn off some persons but you have to recognize again don't have a tunnel vision the first thing you're gonna do is to do your ABCs check so always ABC is gonna come first don't focus on the injured part without ensuring that ABCs are taken care of then you go to that area that is injured do not push down an abdomen so once it's an evisceration you'll avoid pushing down on that area because it can cause further damage only perform a visual assessment Cut clothing close to wound. So if the clothing clothing is 
affected by the wound are impaling the wound, don't pull it out because you'll cause more organ to be pulled out also. So you cut around it. Never pull and clothing stuck to or in the wound channel and that can explain itself. So for hollow organ injuries, again, we say these hollow organs are contain contents that are very acidic. We have the stomach, we know that the um, pyloric acid is in the stomach. We have the intestine with the fe um, fecal matter. We have um, very acidic substances. So once they are spilled, then these are going to be highly toxic and inflammatory and in large possibility for infection to develop. Again, this infection will not develop suddenly. So it will take some time. And most of the time you get caught to these scene, maybe that not, not started, but you will have the general pain initially. So again, it's your index of suspicion, which will guide you and recognize that this can be developing even as you're assessing your patient. So they often have delayed signs and symptoms spill content into abdomen infection develops which can take days hours or days stomach and intestine can leak highly toxic acidic liquid into the peritoneal cavity so all of this is what you should be expecting or suspecting is happening when you have a patient with a open or closed abdominal injury and you should be suspecting that either the hollow organs or the solid organs are affected but if it's this hollow organs, then you expect that their content is spilled and it can be caused by blunt or penetrating trauma. So either one of them, if it's penetrating, we say the wall is perforated, is penetrated, and the underlying organs can be damaged, either the hollow or the solid. So don't, and if it's blunt, it's the same. So not because it's a blunt in, um, mechanism of injury, I say that underlying organs are not injured. For blunt trauma, it can cause the organ to pop. Just the pressure from the outside can cause the organ to pop or burst, rupture, releasing fluids and air. If it's penetrating trauma, it can cause direct injury. So the object, if it's a knife, it can penetrate the wall and can penetrate the hollow organs, also the solid organs. If it's a gunshot wound, just the same, it can pass right through. So you have entrance and an exit wound. And we say because of cavitation, it's gonna create a pathway opening up all the way until it's exit or it's latched. So for gallbladder and urinary bladder, these are all hollow organs. Their contents, when they are spilled, can be very damaging. We know the gallbladder have bile. The urinary bladder have urine, very um, acidic, very toxic. It's waste matter that is excreting from the body so if their contents are spilled in the abdominal cavity expect that severe inflammation infection can develop here in the peritoneal cavity causes pain and it can cause ischemia and infarction so all of these are your index of suspicion that you should have once there's a blunt or penetrating trauma to the abdomen suspect that hollow organs are affected and all of these are what can happen. For the solid organs, again, we said they are very vascular. That's your big thing to note. And once there is, you are injured, severe bleeding can occur, can bleed significantly and cause rapid blood loss, can be hard to identify from physical exam, slowly ooze blood into peritoneal cavity. So if there is Close, if there's a closed abdominal injury, you'll just notice bruising or pain, the person complain of pain, then you should recognize that solid organs can be injured. And if there are, then bleeding is occurring in three. So there is no external hemorrhage. You don't observe any bleeding outside, but just because of the mechanism of injury, you would observe discoloration, pain, at an era, whichever quadrant, then you should suspect that the solid organ within that region are impacted and they are bleeding. It can be fast, it can be slow, depending on the extent of the damage. 
and you should have that index of suspicion and monitor your patient. Again, it's going to be your ABCs. We'll be looking at emergency care and patient assessment. But right away, you should be thinking of what's possible happening. From you get a call, you start to think of your differentials. Person have stab wound, you get a call of person being stabbed, then you should start to tell yourself what possible injuries can be there. Think all of them and do your assessment till you have an idea. Narrow it down, but at the same time, don't have a tunnel vision. Keep it broad and treat what they are presented with. For solid organ injuries, the liver is the largest organ in the abdomen, and we say it's in the right upper quadrant. So again, once there is any sign of mechanism of injury to that quadrant, suspect that the liver is impacted. It's the largest organ in the abdomen, very vascular, and can lead to hypoperfusion. And we should all know by now, hyperperfusion is low perfusion. So because there is loss of blood, then perfusion will be affected. Often injured by fractured lower right rib or penetrating trauma. So once there is blunt or penetrating trauma to that right upper quadrant region in the vicinity of your right lower right rib, then suspect that the liver is impacted. The liver takes up most of that space. It's a very large organ. And again, not only pain on that area, but we say here you can have referred pain to the right shoulder is a common finding with an injured liver. And how we get this referred pain, there is a lining. So you have this lining that lines the organ and also the cavity. So it's the pural lining. We have it in the thoracic cavity. We have it in the abdominal cavity. Those lining have nerves and they are connected. So the nerves will connect to the shoulder and once the person have that injury to the liver, the nerves will give you that, give them the pain to the shoulder. So recognize a person might have an isolated injury to the shoulder and they are focusing on the shoulder, but the mechanism of injury suggests that they have a abdominal impact. So again, have your index of suspicion and not just have a tunnel vision and focus on the shoulder injury only. You should be searching the body because of the mechanism of injury you do a rapid scan and you will find out that there is bruising or pain to the abdomen. And if you don't do your job diligently, then you will miss it. Another solid organ we have in the abdomen is the spleen and the pancreas. So the spleen will be at the left upper quadrant. So it's right behind the stomach. The stomach is a hollow organ, the spleen is solid. Again, it's very vascular, prone to heavy bleeding. We said the spleen contain up to 500 mils of blood. Therefore, if it's injured, just imagine the loss of blood that is likely. Motor vehicle collision can cause it to be impacted. Steering wheel trauma falls from height and both spleen and pancreas, again, these are solid organs. They can become damaged and they are vascular. They will bleed. They can be injured from bicycle and motorcycle accidents involving handlebars. So for the spleen, especially a person get hit in the flank region, the left flank, suspect that it can damage. It's very well protected, but significant forces will have to cause it to be injured. So if the spleen is injured, other organs or other tissue would be damaged in the process because it's going to take great force to cause that injury to the spleen because of the area that it's at. Again, another solid organ we have is the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is right at the borderline, the upper borderline of the abdominal cavity. We said it starts from the diaphragm to the pelvic. That's where the boundaries for the abdominal cavity. So the diaphragm itself can become damaged. And again, right at the borderline, right at the lower rib cage to the lower rib cage, once the damage is in that region, possibly it can damage the diaphragm. The diaphragm can become damaged and you have organs from the abdomen protruding through it into the thoracic cavity. 
this will affect respiration. So the patient now will have difficulty breathing because of the abdominal organs that are now pressing against the lungs and affecting their ability to inhale and exhale. So when penetrated, when the diaphragm is penetrated or ruptured, loops of bowel invade the thoracic cavity. Patient may exhibit dyspnea and that's difficulty breathing. Again, your index of suspicion should be there to guide you as to what is possibly happening based on where on the abdomen is impacted. Very important to recognize that you have the kidneys also as solid organs. They are in the retroperitoneal space, so they are actually behind the true peritoneal space, but they can become damaged also. Again, they are well protected, so again, it's going to be significant force that will cause the kidneys to be injured, but don't tell yourself that they are not. They can be, and when we look at signs and symptoms, that those are what will give an idea of which structures are impacted. But again, just generally have that open mind. If you can narrow it down to which you can, but our job in the field is not to determine which organs are structured or damaged. You will treat what you are presented with and take those patients in because there is not much we can do to fix whichever organ is damaged out in the field. We are going to be treating and stabilizing them to bring them in to where they can get the definitive care, and most of the time it's going to be surgical intervention. So for the kidneys, can cause significant blood loss. Again, all the solid organs are very vascular. So with the problem with the solid organs being injured is bleeding. For the hollow organs, it's going to be contents that are very toxic being spilled into the peritoneal space and cause infection, inflammation, and can lead to septic shock. But for the solid organs, your main concern will be bleeding and hyperperfusion, patient going into um, hypovolemic shock. But for the kidneys, can cause significant blood loss. Common finding is blood in the urine. So that's hematuria, blood in the urine. So you observe, you can ask the patient if they are responsive or you can look for a sign of blood um, at the entrance, exit, um, urethral opening of the penis or vagina. You can blood visible and urinary meatus. Um, that's the same era right at the urethral opening. Indicates significant trauma to genitorial system, genital urinary system. So once there is blood visible and the urethral opening, then suspect that the kidneys are damaged. We have looked at the anatomy and physiology and the structures that are involved in the abdomen, abdomen and which can be injured. Now we will see how you assess these patients with these injuries. So the first thing we're going to look at is general patient assessment. So whatever trauma or medical issues there, you will always do your general patient assessment. General patient assessment doesn't change. It's general for all emergencies. But then we will also look at the specific emergency care that you will give based on the type of injury. So in general, patient assessment of abdominal injuries, you will always start with your scene size up. So scene size up is going to be the starting point for all emergencies. But as it relates to abdominal injuries, the abdominal injuries assessment is difficult. Again, we said the whole range of injuries that you can have from the hollow organs, solid organs, it's not easy for us to determine it. But again, it's not for us to diagnose where exactly the damage, which organ is exactly damaged, just do your general assessment and provide the necessary treatment. But it's saying assessment of abdominal injuries is difficult. Cause of injury may be apparent, but resulting tissue damage may not be. So you will see the bruising, discoloration to a section of a quadrant of the abdomen. The patient will have pain there, but again, that doesn't tell you exactly 
which organ or structure is damaged. Again, think the worst and do your treatment and stabilization. Patient may be overwhelmed with more painful injuries. So again, as I said, they might have a shoulder injury that is very painful to them because of referred pain, or it can also be an isolated injury to the shoulder, but they were impacted from a mechanism, mechanism of injury that affect their abdomen, but they are not feeling that. Again, we say some of the inflammation can take longer to happen, so they might not be having that significant pain to the abdomen. They're focusing on the shoulder, and you also gonna start to focus on it also, but remember, do your due diligence and do your general assessment. And if the person has mechanism of injury, I suggest multi-system trauma, do a rapid scan, and so you will miss critical things. Some injuries develop and worsen over time. So again, don't just narrow in your assessment, think broadly and do what you should do as we'll be going through how you do your general assessment. So with every patient assessment, you will always start with your scene size up. By now, everyone should know you have five main steps to go through. Your scene size up, your primary assessment, your history taking, your secondary assessment, and your reassessment. Those are the five pillars of your patient assessment that you must remember. If you are not doing them, then you are going to be likely missing things and not doing what is best for your patient. But in your scene size up, which is the first thing, regardless of what type of emergency, you must check that the scene is safe. Ensure that the scene is safe for you first, your partner next, patient, then family member by stand and you go down the line. Once the scene is safe, then you're going to go to check the mechanism of injury or nature of illness. And in this case, we are dealing with mechanism of injury, but again, don't be tunnel vision. Think that there can be nature of illness involved with the abdominal injuries. You will also ensure that you take your standard precaution at a minimum. In COVID time, you're going to have your gloves and your mask. Also, you will check the number of patients and seek call for your additional resources if needed. Again, another item you should check with your mechanism of injury, suspect if you're going to determine if you need to take your spinal precaution, spinal motion restriction as the term we are using now. So for your scene size up, ensure that at a minimum you have your gloves and eye protection. Again, I put in for COVID, you need your mask. Be sure the scene is safe for you, and that's the first thing we should be checking. If the scene is not safe, then you can't go any further. Call for your additional resources early if needed. So if you need help, call for it, because again, help in the form of, if you need ALS intervention, you're gonna call for it. Better to call and you don't need it later on than don't call for it and in your assessment, you realize you need it, because you're gonna delay the arrival of those resources. Once you have another important thing, as I mentioned, mechanism of injury, because that is what they're going to use as your main guide to give you an index of suspicion. So don't underestimate or don't play the mechanism of injury. It is very important. Once you go on a scene, you it's trauma related. You're big thing is to find out what is the mechanism of injury because that is what can I use to guide you as to what you're going to suspect is the like the ears of the body impacted and injured. So observe the scene for early indicators of mechanism of injury, MOI. Consider early spinal precaution, that's a must. Consider all injuries the MOI could have produced. And this is where we say these, this is what we call our differentials. So based on your knowledge of anatomy and physiology, once you look at the MOI, you're going to give yourself that index of suspicion of all of the likely injuries that can occur to the body. And as you go to your assessment, then you're going to narrow it down and based on what the signs and symptoms you are getting, it will point you in one or two directions and you go accordingly. But don't have a tunnel vision and just initially start to assume that an area is 
the issue and miss critical areas that may not be as obvious. We call those subtle signs. So if you don't do your due diligence, you can miss the subtle signs and you will not be doing the best for your patient. So as you look at the second aspect of the patient assessment, once you have completed your proper scene size up, then you move to your primary assessment. This is where you go to the live threats. You need to find the live threats immediately after you have sized up your scene. And here's where you're gonna deal with your ABCs. So you're gonna form a general impression initially, looking at your patient, whether they seem to be stable or unstable, seem to be relating to the environment or not. This initial impression will lead, set the pace to how you approach the patient assessment. So quickly form a general impression and note the patient's level of consciousness. Once you have done that, you're moving to ABCs, life threats. Severe external hemorrhage must be addressed before airway are breathing. So we are gonna do normally ABCs, but the only exception they are saying here, and you need to understand it, if there is significant hemorrhage and the operative word there is severe, we call it exsanguinating. The, you observe there is blood spurting from the patient abdomen. You need to recognize that that must be addressed immediately before the airway and breathing. But normally, the airway and breathing will take precedence over the circulation, which is the bleeding. You need to ensure that the patient has a patent airway. So if the patient does not have a patent airway, nothing else matters unless we say in the case where they have severe hemorrhage, then you would move to that first. So ensure you know your steps that you should follow. It's very important. So once you have ensured that the ABCs are taken care of, starting with your airway, breathing, if there's no exsanguinating bleeding, then you go to your circulation. So treat signs and symptoms of shock aggressively. So you control any bleeding, then if a patient shows sign of shock, you will notice from your skin check, the skin is cool, pale, cool and clammy. That's indica indicative of shock. So for treatment of shock, you will give oxygen, put them in a supine position and keep them warm. Again, by the time you finish your ABCs in your primary assessment, you should be making a decision as to whether this patient is a load and go or a stay and play. Once there's any impact to the patient's level of consciousness or ABCs, then that's a high priority patient. You need to be moving from that scene within 10 minutes with that patient. And again, before you package and transport that patient, you will do your rapid scan where it is indicated. So you're not gonna just package and move that patient without checking them thoroughly. Well, not thoroughly, you do a rapid scan within two minutes, you're gonna search the body where it is indicated once they have a significant mechanism of injury, which suggests multi-system trauma, then you are going to search the body to see if there's anything that you have missed before you package them to move but you must make a determination and know that you need to move quickly, but you're gonna do that quick check before you move. After you're finished, so you have gone through your scene size up, you have gone through your primary assessment, you're treated your life threats, you have done your rapid scan, you're going to get your history taken and it's gonna be determined and based on the condition of your patient. So far, patient who is not responsive, you might not be able to get much history from the patient, but don't tell yourself you can't get any history. At a minimum, we can check them if they have any um, bracelet that tells you that they might have a condition medically, but you will get history from family member, bystander, wherever you can get the history, you'll get it. But you will attempt to get a history first. So investigate the chief complaint and the mechanism of injury. Again, this will help you as to how you go forward in your treatment of your patient. So it's very important for the trauma case, it's mainly what you are seeing, but again, history will help you also because you can also have a trauma case with medical issues 
leading up to the trauma and vice versa. So you're going to investigate the chief complaint and specifically you're going to want to look at their MOI some more, investigate the mechanism of injury, identify signs and symptoms and pertinent negatives. So this is where you're trying to narrow it down to where, you lead, where it's leading you, which one of the injuries you're focusing on. Movement of body or abdominal organs irritate peritoneum causing pain. So again, these organs that are injured, the more they move, they can cause more pain and irritate the peritoneum, which is aligning more. A key thing you can use to get your history. So you're gonna use your OPQRST to focus on the chief complaint, especially as it relates to abdominal pain. When did it start? This is your OP, anything cause it to be worse or better. Q, quality of the pain or discomfort and whether it is radiating any referred pain, severity of it, and a scale of one to 10, 10 being the worst, so you rate it. And then the time, is it a constant pain or it come and go as it happened before? So all of that will help you focus on the chief complaint and then you will finish your sample history. So sample, the S is for the signs and symptoms that you would have gotten first, and then you finish it with your amper allergy, any medication, past pertinent history, last oral intake, even leading up to incident. All of these are things that you should know already. We just basically run and show them, but you will do, it for, do them for all patient emergencies. And we are focusing on abdominal and genital urinary injuries. You must do these just the same so you don't miss critical information. You're gonna ask if there is nausea, vomiting or diarrhea. Once there is any abdominal injury, most persons will have nausea, feel like they want to vomit or they would have vomited before you reach or they have in diarrhea. This is important information that will help you and also help the physicians we are going to hand over your patient to. Ask about appearance of any bowel movement and urinary output. This again will give you an idea of which structure is damaged. So if there is feces, then you suspect their um, intestine are damaged. If there is um, blood in the urine, you suspect that the kidney or the bladder affected. So again, this information you're getting might not um, affect your treatment, but again, it's not only for you, but you are the eyes and the ears for the physician who you are taking the patient to. So you need to gather as much information as you can, and especially if patients are responsive, you get information before they, unfortunately, some will go unresponsive on you. So history taking is very important. After you finish your history taking, then it's down to your secondary assessment. And that it, as it says, your secondary assessment is what's gonna be done after your primary assessment. So you will not do your secondary assessment before you do your primary. When you are doing your long case medical and trauma, if you secondary before, primary, then you are setting up yourself for failure. And that's how it will be in the real world. The secondary assessment, as it says, must be done after the primary. And this is where you're going to, if time permit, most of the time you will not have the time to do it based on the nature of your patient. If you are dealing with a critical patient, you'll be taken up dealing with the ABCs. You might not reach to, to do a secondary assessment. Also, the time that you take to reach the facility might be a short transport time so you will not get to do your secondary assessment but if time permits or the patient is not critical that you're focusing on the abcs then you will go to your secondary assessment where you will search to see if there is any other injuries that you had missed from your primary and you also do a more detailed check on the era if there is an isolated injury then you have time to focus on that area so again, it says may not have time to perform in the field. Physical examinations, you're gonna inspect for bleeding, remove or loosen close to exposed injuries. Patient should remain in position of comfort, examine the entire abdomen. So this is where we say you are finished with your primary, 
you're focusing on the individual area now you pay attention to everything and this is where you're gonna use your same DCAP DTLS to assess those area so you're looking for your deformity contusion abrasion puncture penetration laceration swelling but you're focusing on that area once you have gone through your primary and you will also do your vital signs in your secondary assessment use your monitoring devices so we said you're gonna do your physical examination so i mentioned before that in your primary assessment if the mechanism of injury so suggested you do your rapid scan the rapid scan is the same DCAP BTLS you would have done but you're doing it in a two minutes time but for your secondary you're gonna focus on the area now and do a more detailed check or you will also if time allow you can do a full body scan which is um, a more detailed check so you're gonna inspect and palpate for deformities look for presence of contusion abrasion puncture wound penetrating injury burns palpate for tenderness and attempt to localize to specific quadrant of the abdomen so again is you're gonna focus more and go more detailed to narrow it down but again most of the time our job is just to treat what is presented to us and stabilize the patient package them and move with them because again there's a limit to what we can do for them in the field they need to get definitive care surgical intervention but you're gonna stabilize them and move swelling may indicate significant intra-abdominal injury and this secondary assessment if you are having a hypertic patient again we say it would be done en route it's not going to be done unseen so you're not going to be there staying with a patient who is high priority within that 10 minutes you should be completing your abcs prioritize do a rapid scan package and move with that patient and if time allow we say you'll be doing this secondary assessment that we're talking about so swelling may indicate significant intra-abdominal injury again it's just information you'll be getting suspect that there is injury there but again you're not gonna be able to fix that you're just gonna stabilize so treat the patient for shock if it's indicated and ensure the abcs are maintained so as you look at the physical examination you palpate the quadrant furthest away from the quadrant exhibiting signs of injury and pain so once you assess on there having pain to an era you will leave that quadrant last because you don't want to palpate the era that has the pain first and the patient is going to start to guard that era and so it's going to affect how well you're going to get your information from then on so start away from the era that has the pain or abrasion and then you move to that quadrant last allow you to investigate possibility of radiation of pain so you are palpating to see what's going on there but again start from the area away from the immediate area of concern perform full body scan to identify injuries so this full body scan is different from the rapid scan so in the primary we try to bring up the rapid scan to your primary to do a quick head to toe check to find any injuries that are there but the full body scan is a more detailed check which we'll do if you have time again we most cases you will not get time to do it either because of the critical nature of your patient or because of the short transport time to the receiving facility if you find life threat stop and treat it so once you come to your secondary you would have done your primary and you have missed something here if you find something in your secondary then you must treat it as a life threat so again it is to find and treat all immediate and potential life threat you might miss the potential one in your primary you have the secondary to do it if time allows assess need for spinal immobilization and that would have been done from your scene size up you have suspected it based on your mechanism of injury when you come to your primary your loc check you're gonna do it with manual stabilization and by the time you finish your primary going down to rapid scan you must have now fully immobilized your patient before you package them completely to move 
Uh, we're talking about spinal motion restriction now. Physical examination continue in your secondary. You're going to inspect and palpate kidney area for tenderness, bruising, swelling, or other trauma signs. Again, we say they have um, pain to the flank, um, left arm um, flank, then a right flank, then suspect that the kidney um, can be damaged. Hollow organ will spill content into the peritoneal cavity. We all recognize that. So again, you're getting your index of suspicion, trying to confirm what is going on. But remember, our job is not to diagnose. We are just going to have that index of suspicion. We're going to suspect because we won't know for sure. We suspect and we treat and stabilize taking the patient. In your secondary assessment, that's where you're going to do your vital signs. If you have time and resources and seen when you are doing a rapid scan, you could assign a team member to do the right, start the vital signs. If that is not practical, by the time you're in your ambulance going with your patient now, then you're going to do your vital signs in that secondary assessment. And we all know the seven, at least seven vital signs you should be getting. So you need to visit back the LOC is a vital sign, the pupillary reaction, two in your head. You have three in the chest, your respiration, and you're going to be the rate, rhythm, quality. You're going to check your pulse, rate, rhythm, and strength. Also, you're going to check the BP. You're going to check your skin, color, moisture, condition. You're going to check your cap refill. So at a minimum, you should be getting those seven vital signs. And as a eight vital sign, you will check the GMR based on the patient being diabetic or altered mental status. So at least seven possible eight vital signs you must be getting. Many abdominal emergencies can cause a rapid pulse and low blood pressure. So again, it's just that initial body trying to compensate. So you're going to have the heart rate go up, respiratory rate go up, blood pressure can be low. So you need to ensure that you check all those in your vital signs. Record of vital signs will help identify changes in condition. So ensure that the first blood pressure is done with a manual blood pressure machine, that's your spigma manometer. You must use your manual to get that first blood pressure. If you can use your digital or electronic to trend it afterward, but at a minimum, you must get that first one. That's the best way of getting the blood pressure. So ensure you get that one. And because you're going to use these vital signs to trend, trend the patient condition, is that are they getting better or worse? Are they remaining the same? Very useful information, but again, you're not going to rely on these things totally. Look at your patient, check the patient, how they're presenting to you. Uh, monitoring devices are good to so, so much and no more. But you will use whatever monitoring devices you have available. As we look at, so that's complete the Okay, we're going to look at um, assessment of isolated abdominal injury. So once you have an isolated abdominal injury in your secondary assessment, you're going to focus on that area. So visually inspect the abdomen for penetrating wounds. If an entrance wound is found, check for a corresponding exit wound. Do not remove an impaled object. Wherever in the body you have an impaled object, it is not removed, but for the airway, you remove it if it's affecting your doing CPR. But we are focusing on the abdominal injuries. So if there's an impaled object, you'll stabilize it, control the bleeding, and stabilize it in place with bulky dressing to prevent movement. Because you don't want it moving and causing further damage, but you're not going to remove it. The same with any eviscerated organ, intestine protruding, you're not going to try to push it back in, uh, replace it, you just secure, um, cover it 
with your moisten sterile dressing. If the entrance wound, if an entrance wound is found, check for a corresponding exit wound. Don't overlook it in your lung case trauma cases. Remember, once there's an entrance wound, tell yourself that there's a possible exit wound. You must look for it. The last part of your patient assessment, remember it's five steps we said, your scene size up, your primary assessment, your history taking, your secondary assessment, and you must finish with a reassessment. So you are in the ambulance going with your patient to the receiving facility. You have completed your secondary assessment. Now tell yourself that you're gonna sleep along the way with the patient, you must do your reassessment. What do you do in your reassessment? Every patient will get a reassessment or should get a reassessment. You're gonna repeat everything that you have done so far for your patient. So you're gonna go back to the beginning you're not on the scene anymore, so you don't necessarily gonna do a scene size up. You're gonna start from your primary assessment. So you're gonna go back to the patient's level of consciousness. You're gonna check back their ABCs. You're gonna reassess the chief complaint. You're gonna reassess the vital signs. You're gonna reassess your interventions and treatment and any newly identified issue, anything that needs to be corrected, you must correct it. And for your stable patient, you're gonna reassess every 15 minutes for your unstable patient, your critical patients. You're gonna reassess every five minutes. Once you have continued going on with your reassessment, then you can start your communication. Once you have gotten all your information, you'd have done your communication from your finish getting your vital signs initially, you'd have contacted the receiving facility and given them information in the patient. Along the way, if time allow, you can start your documentation. Some persons cannot write while they're driving in the ambulance, so most persons will wait until you finish handover, you do your documentation. But you can start from there. Sometimes we do some rough chatting. You start to write down your vital signs there, get things together to complete it. But you're gonna outline the patient's mechanism of injury in your documentation, injuries and relevant vital signs. You would have done documentation, I guess, already. Now we have completed the general patient assessment that you would do on a patient with abdominal injury. And it's the same general patient assessment you do for all patients. But now you're gonna see how we're gonna do the specific emergency care for the different abdominal injuries that we can be call to that will be presented. So in immediate medical care, as it relates to abdominal injuries, if it's a close abdominal injury, you want to monitor and evaluate for progression in shock. So again, if it's close abdominal injury, the wall of the abdomen will not be penetrated or perforated, so you will not have external bleeding, but your index of suspicion should tell you that there is likely internal bleeding. So the person will have pain, bruising, um, per, um, discoloration of the an ear and the abdomen, suspect that underlying organs, either hollow or solid, are injured. And so bleeding can be there. So you're gonna monitor and evaluate for progression of shock. We say it can start gradually and develop. So you need to be monitoring the patient. Again, you're gonna start with your same general patient assessment. You'd have started with your checking LOC, ABCs, and then you come down. The patient may experience nausea and vomiting, as we said earlier on. So ask about it and prepare for it and um, assist them with it. Administer oxygen to patients who are unconscious or in shock. So we said the treatment for shock, oxygen, supine position, keep them warm, assist ventilation if necessary. Again, once they are not ventilating properly, so once you assess their ABCs, you check breathing, they are breathing, yes. How is the breathing? One of the first thing you wanna check, rise and fall of the chest. Is it adequate rise and fall of the chest? If it's shallow, then you must assist with ventilation. Shallow ventilation means they are not bringing in enough air 
to reach to that alveoli level with enough to diffuse across the membrane. So you must assist them if it's shallow. Also, is the rate too slow? If it's under eight, then that's not enough to bring in enough oxygen. Again, remember, tidal volume is rate times um, the depth. So consider you need to assist ventilation if it's shallow or too slow. Consider calling ALS for gastric tube placement. Again, you want to get out the fluid, but again, that's advanced stuff. So we are talking about emergency medical care specific to abdominal injuries. If it's open abdominal injury, then we know that the wall of the, in, the abdomen is penetrated, and this is where you're going to have external bleeding. So you will have to control whatever external bleeding is there. If it's an evisceration, then we know the method of controlling it. You're going to use your moist and sterile gauze. He suggested that you have an occlusive dressing also to prevent ear from going into this space. But the patient with penetrating injuries, generally obvious wounds, external bleeding, and again, don't have that tunnel vision where you just want to focus on it and forget about your ABC. So everything will start with your ABCs, your general patient assessment, and you start to narrow it down to the specific that you're trying to um, locate. But again, it's treating what is presented. Maintain a high index of suspicion for serious unseen blood loss. So that high index of suspicion should be there. Once there is opening abdominal injury, you will have external bleeding, but still tell yourself that underlying organ, you can still have both external and internal bleeding. So even though you have control external bleeding, possible internal bleeding can still be taking place with an open abdominal injury. Continued open abdominal injuries, inspect patients back and side for exit wounds. So remember, if there's an entrance wound, suspect that there is an exit wound and your job is to find it if it is there. Apply dry sterile dressing to all open wounds, but for the evisceration, once there's an exposed organ, it need to be moist and sterile dressing because you want to prevent that organ or tissue from drying out. It can lose the heat easily, so you need to keep it moist. But if it's not an organ, then you just use your dry sterile dressing as a main means of controlling bleeding. If penetrating object is still in place, apply stabilizing bandage around it, and we said that before. So for an evisceration, it's going to be very gruesome. And again, you will want to have tunnel vision. But remember, ABC is first. If it's not exsanguinating or severe bleeding, ensure you check the ABC. Airway, breathing first before you go to that bleeding control. Severe lacerations of abdominal, abdominal wall may result in internal organs or fat protruding through the wound. So you can have any one of the abdominal organs are content in protruding, that's an evisceration. How will you deal with it? Never try to replace a protruding organ. Keep the organ moist and warm, cover with moist and sterile dressing, secure dressing with bandages, secure bandages with tape. So ensure you know how to deal with an evisceration and there's a diagram of it. You can study it. So you need your occlusive dressing, your myosin sterile dressing first, then your occlusive dressing. And in this case, you can tape all four sides. And like the chest um, penetrating injury to the chest, you need to seal three sides and leave one side as a flutter valve. But in for the abdomen, you can seal four sides, all four sides. We have now completed the abdominal injuries we are going to look at the second part of this chapter which is the genitorial injuries so any injury you're dealing with you need to know the system that is affected so for the 
genital urinary system we say it involves the structures of the reproductive system as also the structures of the urinary system so these two systems combine and they share organs and they they are interrelated so the, the anatomy you need to know the anatomy and the physiology and you should have no you know this already you went through this already you're just quickly refreshing it so it controls reproductive functions and waste discharge organs of the genital urinary system are located in the abdomen male genitalia lies outside the pelvic cavity and the female genitalia lies within the pelvic cavity we also have a portion of each of them so a portion of the male is still within the cavity while a portion of the female genitalia is outside but predominantly that's how they are and this is your diagram you should all know this diagram already so we're not gonna spend much time on it just know the structure so you're gonna have for the uh, male you have the bladder urinary bladder you have the ureter which is coming ureter which is coming from the kidneys and you're gonna have the ureter which is passing through the penis and exiting at the tip and then you have the testes connected to the um, era of the um, coming through the prostate gland so have that general knowledge for the female you have the fallopian tube connected to the ovaries and connected to the uterus which connect to the outside to the um, vagina which I, um, exit on the outside have that general diagram there and we will see what can happen when we have injuries to these structures so the first thing is to know the structures that are there both for the male and female and then you can see what kind of injuries that can occur so we see where there is a kidney that's a main structure that is there main organ so when you have kidney injuries not uncommon and rarely occur in isolation so again we say the kidneys are very well protected they are in the retro peritoneal space they are actually behind the two peritoneal space or um, cavity so they are well protected and for them to be injured or damaged it's gonna take great force that means other structures are tissues gonna be injured also so the kidney lie in well protected area forceful blow or penetrating injury often involved to cause them to damage suspect kidney damage if the patient has evidence of any of the following so once there is abrasion and we all know what is abrasion once there is abrasion laceration so abrasion is basically scraping of the skin um, laceration um, a cut contusion which is bruising or the same discoloration ecchymosis on the flank then you're gonna suspect and the flank is the side between the lower rib cage and your hip and either side that's the flank to the lateral aspect that's your flank so once you notice any one of these signs tell yourself that possible kidney damage is there again we don't know for sure but we're always gonna think the worst penetrating wound in region of flank or upper abdomen fractures on either side of the lower rib cage are a lower thoracic or upper lumbar vertebrae a hematoma in the flank region so any signs of injury you see in that region have that index of suspicion that the kidney can be injured we won't know for sure we think the worst until we know otherwise urinary bladder injuries we see from the anatomy the urinary bladder is and again in the retroperitoneal space almost deep in the pelvic so again it's gonna take great force to injure the urinary bladder but it's not impossible may result in a rupture urine spills into surrounding tissue again if the urinary bladder is full at the point of injury 
impact, then it's more likely to get injured. Blunt injuries to lower abdomen or pelvis can rupture urinary bladder. And when, with the rupture of the urinary bladder, you're gonna have urine spilled in the surrounding tissue. And again, we say it's very toxic, so it can cause serious inflammatory and um, infection can arise. Again, it's not gonna happen quickly, but it will develop over time. In males, sudden deceleration can shear the bladder from the urethra. In later trimester of pregnancy, bladder injuries increase. So we say in the second and third trimester, the um, uterus is gonna displace the urinary bladder. So it's gonna push it to the front and therefore it will be more likely to get injured or damaged. So we see the position of the urinary bladder within that pelvic cavity. So it's well protected normally, but it's as it says in um, pregnant mothers, then it's gonna be displaced anteriorly and it's gonna be more prone to injury. Again, if there is fracture of the pelvic bone, they themselves can cause rupturing of the urinary bladder. So for the male genitalia, and we say primarily it's external, so you can have soft tissue wounds. Again, these organs, both the female and male genitalia, they are very vascular and they have they are rich in nerves. So the injury will be painful and can cause bleeding. But again, don't have that tunnel vision. Focus on ABCs first, and then you can focus on this era. Again, these are not usually life-threatening injuries. So soft tissue wounds can be um, caused and it can be painful and of great concern for the patient. So imagine that's over 10%, both female and male, we call it, um, not 10%, that's the 1%. So we'll concern so much about it and you know, but it's not that usually not life-threatening, should not be given priority over more severe wounds unless there is severe bleeding. Again, use that um, rule. Once it's not exsanguinating, then you focus on the airway and breathing first. Pain may be referred to lower abdomen. And again, it's all about the connecting nerves that you have. So the injury can be to the genitalia, but the referred connecting nerves can cause referred pain to the lower abdomen. We talk about the peritoneum, it have nerves that will cause referred pain. For the female genitalia, again, we say most of it is within the pelvic cavity, but you also have that outer portion of it. So internal female genitalia, it's gonna be the uterus, the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, and again, these are rarely damaged because they are mainly well protected. In pregnancy, the uterus is gonna be enlarged, and so it's gonna be more exposed anteriorly and can be more prone for injury. So uterus enlarges substantially and rises out of pelvis. Injuries can be serious. Also keep fetus in mind. So because it is prepared for the fetus and the fetus is there also, it will have rise to Sorry about that. Because the fetus is there and the uterus should have been prepared for that fetus, it's gonna be very vascular, more vascular than normal, and damage to it can give rise to serious hemorrhage. For the female genitalia, we said there is an external portion to it. So that's the vulva, the clitoris, the major and minor labia, that's the area surrounding the opening of the vagina. And these are very rich in nerve supply, just like the male um, genitalia, 
very rich in nerves and also vascular. So you can have very painful injuries to the female genitalia and also you can have um, bleeding. So consider sexual assault and pregnancy. So normally it's protected. So these ears are protected. So it's normally not prone to injury, but most of the time when it's injured, you would consider sexual assault or pregnancy. If external bleeding, a sterile absorbing sanitary pad may be applied to the labia. So mainly that's how you're gonna control bleeding. Just use the absorbing sanitary pad and use your um, diaper type um, We are bandaging it. So at no point you're going to insert anything into the vagina. If the um, female has a tampon in place already, you can leave it, but you are not gonna insert any or anything else. You're gonna pack anything in the vagina to control the bleeding. Just use the sanitary nap um, pad or napkin and use your diaper type um, way of bandaging it. And what you need to note is the type amount of banded pads that has been soaked already. You make note because again, information to help you to give an idea of an estimate of the amount of blood loss but also for the physician who you're going to hand over care to so they can have an idea themselves again with these injuries because of so much concern for our one percent we want to um the patients will be embarrassed they don't want persons to be viewing them so um, you at all times you're gonna be advocate for our patients. So in these cases, we need to maintain their privacy. So um, where possible, you need a female to deal with a female. Um, in the case of the uh, male, you um, so you need to have same gender dealing with the assessment. If you need to um, inspect or assess the genitalia, you're gonna provide privacy. So more than likely you try to get the person into the ambulance to maintain their privacy minimum you don't want to have a lot of persons around them while they're doing your assessment but be maintain a professional presence so i know we're not gonna be judgmental no matter what the cause it can be sexual assault um, whatever don't be judgmental to the patient our job is to be professional at all times and be an advocate for our patient that's very important in these cases of sexual assault there will be the medical aspect but also the psychological effect on the patient so you need to provide that reassurance and care in that regard again general patient assessment for these patients with genital urinary injuries injuries to the reproductive system injuries to the urinary system structures and organ general patient assessment will be the same. So we're not gonna focus too much on that part of it. You're just gonna run through it. So you ensure the scene is safe. Again, cases where you have um, sexual assault can be perpetrator who committed the act might be there and think about your safety in that respect. So ensure law enforcement are there and seen. Apply standard precaution. So again, your scene size up will always be your safety first, your team member, patient, bystander, family member, mechanism of injury, nature of illness. In this case, we're dealing about um, primarily trauma. So you're gonna focus on your MOI to give you that index of suspicion. Again, still consider the possibility of spinal injury. So you take a precaution. Number of patient standard precaution in general, minimum of your gloves. In the, COVID time, your mask, eyewear, possible um, blood or fluid, body substance. All... Yes, you have a comment? Um, class, are you hearing me okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so your general 
seen size up will be the same. You will in, look for the indicators of mechanism of injury. Patient may avoid discussing to um, avoid undergoing physical exam. It's their right. You will again respect the patient's right for privacy. Patient may provide an MOI that seems less embarrassing than the actual MOI. Again, we say most of the time these injuries occur from sexual assault. It can be um, routine sex, um, so sexual activity. So again, they might not want to tell you exactly how it occurs, so they might don't play it. But again, just treat what they are presented with and don't be judgmental. And you will pick that up even from your scene size up. But ensure you check that the scene is safe. If you need to call for law enforcement, you get them there. And you ensure that you look at the MOI, have an idea of what can be possible injuries from what you see the MOI is, and ensure you take your precautions and call for your backup if you need to. You will perform your primary assessment just the same in general, getting your general impression, checking your LOC with or without manual stabilization, focus on your ABCs. So we said that the genital so urinary systems are very vascular, so you can have life-threatening hemorrhage, so it must be addressed immediately. But usually we say they are not life-threatening, but the case is that it can be. Um, ensure that you focus on your ABCs. Again, don't go to the injured area before you have ensured that the patient has a patent airway is breathing and well ventilating properly. Unless there is life threatening bleeding, you move to the bleeding first. So always airway breathing first, ensure the patient has a clear and patent airway, ventilate if needed. So we say look at the rise and fall of the chest. If it's shallow, they need assisted ventilation. If it's too slow, they need assisted ventilation. Consider advanced airway if patient is and responsive and that's where you're gonna need to call for your backup from the scene size up if you suspect that it's needed again circulation will come after abcs unless there is life-threatening bleeding um, you need to assess the pulse rate quality close injuries do not have visible signs of bleeding if there is external bleeding then you need to control them and treat for shock, oxygen, supine position, and keep them warm. Before you finish your primary assessment, in all cases, you must make a determination as to your transport decision, whether this is a high priority patient, whether you need to move right away, or you have time to stay and play. But that decision must be made before you complete your primary assessment. And once that decision is made, you're going to decide also to do a rapid scan, yes or no, based on your mechanism of injury. If it's an isolated case to the genitalia, then you focus on it. But if it's not, there is multiple system trauma involved, and that also involves the genital system, then you must do a rapid scan of your patient in that last part of your primary assessment. And these patients must be taken to a trauma center where they can get that surgical intervention. As you continue with your patient assessment, in general for these population with genitourinary injuries, you want to ensure that you get your history done. Again, we say history is important because it's gonna help you as you try to look at the chief complaint, what is, has happened to the patient. So investigate chief complaint, and we say you will use your OPQRST as it relates to what is happening. It's um, a pain acronym, but it cannot be applied to any chief complaint that the patient is having. And also you will complete it with your sample history. So as you investigate chief complaint, come on associated complaint with genital urinary injuries are nausea and vomiting. They will have diarrhea. 
blood in the urine, vomiting blood. Um, they will have abnormal bowel and bladder habits. Again, you will observe these things and you will get information about it. So ask, you need to ask. So as you get your history taken, these acronyms are there to help you so you don't miss information. So use up your OPQRST, know the relevant question to ask in each of them, and you will complete your sample history. I know we should all know what those stand for. Ask patient about output. So um, is there blood in the urine? Hematuria. Um, ask about allergies. Last intake of food and um, fluid. These things, food or fluid, could be what is causing them to have these issues. And it could be those content that are um, spilled in the cavity. Address events leading up to injury. Again, that will give you an index of suspicion. What were they doing when this injury occurred? So that can help you as you look towards what possible injuries they could have had apart from what you are seeing on the outside. Physical examination. So once you have gotten your history, so you at all times you're gonna start with your scene size up, followed by your primary assessment, where you get your ABCs dealt with. You're gonna do your history taking. Again, once the patient is responsive, you wanna get that history taken first. For trauma, you're gonna focus mainly on your primary assessment and your secondary assessment, but you will attempt to get whatever history you can get. Very important. So once you have gotten your history taken, you're gonna move to your secondary assessment, where we say you would have gone to look at a specific area, if it's an isolated injury. So if it's just the genitalia injured, then you can focus on it. And also you will get your vitals. And also if it's um, full body um, that is affected, then you still still do your full body scan. So the genitourinary system injuries can be acquired to access and assess and treat focus on specific region of the body when isolated injury is present. Look for DCAP BTLS, identify wounds and control bleeding. That's what you'd have missed from your primary. You have time now to deal with it in your secondary, but critically you need to get your vital signs and reassess frequently. And I told about those seven primary vital signs that you must be getting for all your patients. Again, you must complete your patient assessment by completing your reassessment. You cannot complete a patient assessment and you don't do your reassessment. You must continue assessing. This is what gonna trend your patient condition. Give an idea if patient is getting better or worse or remaining the same. So again, always remember, you're basically going back over all you have done for your patient. That is what we do in the reassessment. So you go back to your primary assessment, go back to the LOC, check back on the patient LOC, Check back the ABCs, check back the chief complaint, check back the vital signs, reassess whatever intervention you have, you have performed. A lot of times we just assume that you give the patient, you are giving oxygen and you assume that the oxygen tank is still full. It could be there empty and the patient have the mask on and they're not getting any oxygen and you just assume that it is so. You must look back on the tank and ensure that the gauge is re re reading supply um, in the tank. Also, whatever intervention, if need to be corrected, you have control bleeding, look back and check if the bleeding has started. The ambulance is moving, patient could, the bleeding can start again. You, didn't, you don't know if you don't check it. Again, communication would have been done to the receiving facility immediately after you have gotten your vital signs and your history and completed the ABCs. Once you are about to move, then you have called the receiving facility and giving them the information on your patient. As you continue in your reassessment, you would have decided if you can start your proper documentation or you just do some rough um, note of what you have found so far, because you will do a documentation detail for every patient care. So communicate all concerns to hospital staff. Again, that would have been done, should have been done at the end of your secondary assessment. Describe and document all injuries and treatment given. These 
Some of these cases can be become a legal matter if it's a sexual assault case. You can be called to give evidence in court. So ensure your document is detailed and thorough. Ensure it is legible. Ensure you do everything properly. And you can be called even three, four years down the line. So ensure that it is well documented. So that's your general patient assessment. And again, it's the same for all patient population. Now we're going to see how you would focus on the specific genitourinary injuries, specifically emer emergency medical care. So once you have gone through your general patient assessment, you're going to focus as to the specific injury as it relates to these types. So if it's a kidney injury, injury may not be, injuries may not be obvious. You will see signs of shock and blood in urine. So all injuries and sickness comes with what we call a cardinal signs. So they are general signs and symptoms, but there are some cardinal signs. These are signs that make it specific or individual to a certain type of injury or sickness or disease. So for a kidney injury, you might not know unless you observe or you are told that there's blood in the urine, then that is what gonna give you that more likely reason it's been a kidney injury. But if you don't know or see any blood in the urine, you're gonna just treat what is presented. So you would have observed the patient is showing signs of shock from the PL cool clammy skin, then it is treatment for shock. So it's general again, but it can be specific. Again, we are not gonna try to be um, diagnostic out in the field, just to treat what is presented with in general. And if you can narrow it down, you narrow it down. But again, in most cases, not gonna make a difference whether it's kidney or it is bladder, urinary bladder or whichever organ treatment is you're gonna do that supportive care stabilize and package but you are you're gonna get as much information to give as your handover most of it is gonna help the receiving facility when they take over care so for a urinary bladder injury you're gonna suspect it if you see blood at the urethral opening signs of trauma to lower abdomen pelvis are perineum and the perineum is that area between the um, vagina and the anus or the penis and the anus <clears throat> in presence of shock or associated injuries so if there is signs of shock and associated injuries then you're gonna suspect it so you're gonna transport promptly so again high priority patient Within 10 minutes, you need to get them off that scene. Package, do your rapid scan if you, it's indicated. Package, mobilize, provide spinal motion restriction if indicated. And you're going to be moving with that patient to get them to that trauma center where we say um, they have capability for surgical intervention. That's where they're going to get the help they need and monitor vital signs en route. If it's the external male genitalia that is affected, make the patient comfortable. Again, we say they are maybe more embarrassed, um, embarrassed than anything else. Usually we say it's not life-threatening, but it can be very painful. It can have um, bleeding, yes, because it's um, very vascular. But um, so you're gonna, if the skin is stripped, so wherever you have exposed organ or tissue, you need to have that um, moistened um, dressing to keep it from drying out. And you need to apply direct pressure with sterile gauze to deal with the bleeding itself. Never move or manipulate foreign objects in the urethra. And we know the urethra, it is that um, opening in the penis or that um, urinal, um, urethral opening in the um, vagina. So you need to, if there's any impale object, wherever, then we're not gonna 
remove it unless we're talking about airway where it's affecting your ability to, to um, patient ventilate or give CPR. But for genital urinary injuries, no impaled object should be moved, whether it's in the um, urethral opening and it might be um, in the um, anus, you don't move any of those, you stabilize them in place. For the external male genitalia, identify and take a vulge part in bag to hospital with patient. Again, you might not think it can be replaced, but most cases it's possible that it can be replaced. So ensure you give the patient the best chance of it being replaced. So um, if you can um, find it, you're not gonna spend time on seeing extends excessive time trying to find an amputated part but if possible you will try to um, secure it and bring it in again it's gonna be put it in um, a container seal container and have it in um, cool you don't want to place it directly on ice so amputation of the penal shaft managing blood as is top priority so um, you're not gonna put a tourniquet to stop it, but at least you will apply your sterile dressing. Pressure dressing should normally control most bleeding in that era. Um, surgical reconstruction is possible if you can locate the amputated part. And the word there is if you can, if. So if you can locate it, you do, but you're not going to spend time excessively because the um, limb, yes, but life is more over the limb or the penis. Um, I guess persons will think otherwise, but as a EMS provider, you're gonna do the best for the overall person. That's our mandate. So external male genitalia continue. When an erect penis is bent sharply, the shaft can be severely damaged. So a lot of these cases that will be called to is caused from um, sexual activity, whether it is um, assault or routine. So again, don't be judgmental. Just treat the person as you would want to be treated. Be the advocate and do what's necessary for the patient. Sometimes you require surgical repair associated with intense pain, bleeding, and fear. Again, we are going to be very much the person we concerned about the 1%. The, the, the thought of not being able to um, be able to perform again or have the use of it. So again, that psychological aspect of it is there. We will have to come in and give that reassurance. You might not have to do much uh, medical care. You might more have to be doing psychological care. Um, the, you can have laceration of the head of the penis associated with heavy bleeding. Again, we say these choke, it's very vascular. Apply local pressure with sterile dressing, and that should control most bleeding. Again, we're gonna start from your ABC. So if the bleeding is such that the ABC is affected, then you'd have start your general patient assessment, and we are coming down to the specific care that you would give. But remember, everything gonna be starting from your general already. So the skin um, of the shaft or foreskin caught in a zipper, it can be just two um, zip. You can try and unzip it, but if it's a large amount of zipper that it's caught in, then you have to just cut the zip itself and move it with the patient. But ensure that you tell the patient or show them what you're gonna do because you don't want somebody, somebody not gonna like you just approaching them with the scissors in that area. So if seg small segment of zipper is involved, try to unzip. If long segment of zipper is involved, cut the zipper out of the pants with heavy scissors. But again, tell them what you're doing. External male genitalia continued. If you have urethral injuries, these are not uncommon. So we said the urethral that opening at the tip of the penis can uh, as a result from strata injuries so you're riding the bicycle or your bike and you go on it awkwardly and it get hit 
can cause from pelvic fractures and penetrate in wounds of the perineum. Important to know if patient can urinate and if there is blood in the urine. Foreign bodies protruding from urethra will have to be surgically removed. And we talked about that already. You we'll just stabilize them in place and move with the patient. Um, again, you know, it's just asking these questions to assist when you hand over, but more, it's not going to change our approach to how we care for the patient, but it's just to stabilize, package, and recognize that if there is shock, signs of shock, you treat them and move. If it's a vulsion of the skin of the scrotum, it may damage the scrotal contents. So again, preserve a vulsion skin in a moist, sterile dressing. So anything that is um, a vulsion cut off completely, you secure it, wrap scrotal contents or perennial area with a sterile moist compress so once there is exposed organ you want to keep it moist to prevent it from drying out but at the same time you want to control whatever bleeding is there so direct blows to scrotum can scrotum can result in a rupture of a testicle or accumulation of blood around the testes so apply ice to scrotal area For the female genitalia, and um, we say you can have the internal aspect of it, but you have the external portion, the vulva, lipia, the clitoris. So treat laceration and avulsions with moist, sterile compresses. And again, you use your diaper type um, bandage to hold them in place. Use local pressure to control bleeding and hold the dressing in place with diaper type bandage. Do not pack dressings into the vagina. Uh, we talked about that already. So no um, tampon, no um, packing of the vagina to control the bleeding. Just use those um, sanitary um, napkins or pad to control whatever bleeding is there. For the female genitalia, continue. Leave any foreign bodies in place. So whether male or female, any foreign body, you're going to leave it there, stabilize. Stabilize it in place. And injuries are painful, but not life-threatening, usually. So just remember, it is more of a um, the embarrassment and the um, privacy and all of that. So it's about the psychological aspect of it. Um, you can have um, rectal bleeding, common complaint, can possibly cause from sexual assault. You can have hemorrhoids, colitis, which is the inflammation of the um, colon, the large intestine. You can have um, ulcers, um, rectal foreign bodies. So again, don't be judgmental. Just treat what you are presented with as best as you can and bring the patients in. So it, a major cause of these injuries can be from sexual assault. And you need to recognize that this is a crime scene. So you need to, you are there to provide the medical care. You are not there to solve the case. Leave that to the law enforcement. But in doing your job, our job, we try to preserve the evidence as best as possible because we know that it's going to be a crime scene. It's, it's a crime scene and they're going to need to come in and do the investigation. So you're not going to disturb the scene unnecessarily, but at the same time, you have to provide that medical care and also the psychological as aspect of the care. So sexual assault and rape are common. Victims are generally women, but we know that men and children are no um, victims. So often there is little you can do beyond providing compassion and transport. As, as we said, there is the um, embarrassment of it. There is the, the pain involved, yes, but usually we say it's not life-threatening. So it's about providing that um, supportive care. And again, recognize that it's the crime scene. So we try to preserve evidence as best as possible. 
So patient we may have sustained multi-system trauma and need treatment for shock. So in those cases, you have to do your general patient assessment. You would have recognized that there is signs of shock, provide a treatment, oxygenate, and um, give them um, assist ventilation if needed. But it's to recognize that it's a crime scene. And again, we will see further that you would need to take that precaution. Do not examine genitalia unless obvious bleeding requires application of dressing. So most of the cases you will not need to expose unless there's mention of bleeding or you observe, then you would expose. So normally we don't need to expose the genitalia, but either female or male. Follow appropriate procedures and protocol. Shield patient from curious and lookers. Document patient's history, assessment, treatment, and response to treatment. Again, we say this is a legal. These cases are normally called up to go to court. You might be called. Your report becomes a key document that will be presented, and you will have to give account. So just be objective just write what you see what you are told put what the patient says in quotation mark and be as thorough as you can as it relates to the patient um, remember you will try to encourage them not to bead not to void not to urinate not to for the female not to douche um, because you're trying to preserve evidence as best as possible. If they insist that they want to, you cannot stop them. Once a person is deemed competent, then you encourage them if they're gonna urinate, urinate in a sterile container and you seal it and leave it for the police or you take it in. Again, you are being an advocate all around, trying to do your part for the patient, but also to the extension of doing what you can to assist with the continuing of that um, crime scene investigation. So follow crime scene policy of your EMS system. So wherever you're working, every institution should have their protocols, their policies that will guide how we perform or how you perform out in the field. So you must know it. You can be working for a summary and you don't know the protocol of what you should be doing when something happens. And when it happens, that's when you're going to ask what you should do. You should know the protocols and they should have it as a document there available for everybody to see. And you should try and know it. You might not know everything all the time, but at least you should try to know the main things that you'll be called upon to do. So follow crime scene policy of your EMS system. Advise patient not to wash, beard, shower, douche, urinate, or defecate until after examination. If oral penetration occurred, advise patient not to eat, drink, brush the teeth, or use mouthwash until after examination. This is all about trying to preserve the evidence. In doing those things, they can run the risk or chance of losing that information or that um, evidence. And that's the way they're going to get to the perpetrator. So the DNA evidence that is there for the perpetrator and the patient, when they do those things, they run the risk of washing them away contaminating them and it is trying to preserve that evidence. Handle patients clothes as little as possible. So if there's anything that you need to remove or cut off, you put them in paper bag. Once any clothing can have semen or anything on it, paper bag is a choice because um, paper bag will cause an item to dry out naturally. If it's plastic, then you can produce mold and affect the evidence. So hand the patient's close as little as possible. Make sure EMT caring for a patient is same gender as patient whenever possible. Imagine a female has been raped and you have a male EMT approaching her. She's going to be traumatized by that male already, if it's a male, because it could have been a female that caused the great, um commit the act, but um, we are assuming most cases it's going to be a male commit act and a female. So ideally, you want to have a female EMT. If you don't have a female EMT, you can ask for a 
female friend of the patient to be there or a female police officer. Treat medical injuries and provide privacy, support, and reassurance. So again, it's about the embarrassment that they are going through. It's about the um, trauma. So they need that psychological support. And we are there to be a general advocate for our patients. So ensure you provide that and don't be judgmental. And we have come to the end of this chapter. Uh, as we prepare to go for the break, are there any questions?